Yapıldı. Okay. So let's start. Um, in the last lecture, we talked about um, alternative ways of uh, looking at geometry in order to fit them into a neural network. Okay. Um, and the question, I mean, what we did is resulted to something which we called functional maps, uh, which was a way of looking at the eigenfunctions of the Laplace Beltrami operators and saying, uh, let's operate in that domain. And in that domain, things are a little bit simpler because we can work in a small dimensional domain and then uh, we can basically uh, work with, um, uh, with fully connected networks because when you have low dimensionality, then this is where fully connected comes into, uh, comes into question. Uh, but there are more fundamental problems between uh, geometry uh, about how you can fit geometric problems into, uh, into neural networks. Now, if we look at this specific case where we have a surface, okay, a manifold, a two-dimensional manifold, and by luck, somebody already triangulated this manifold to me, I would like the, the algorithm, the algorithm that I invent in order to classify, in order to match, in order to reconstruct, in order to do whatever to the manifold, I would like it to be invariant to the way that I sampled and, and triangulated the surface. I mean, I don't want it to be uh, dependent on that. And to that end, we uh, designed uh, Laplacians that were in some sense consistent. I mean, they would, I mean, uh, you could show that they would converge to the continuous Laplacian as you refine your grid, no matter how you uh, choose <coughs> your triangulator to be. However, in using graphs in order in, I mean, there are other problems in which the structure of the graph is really, really important. You can think, for example, uh, at Google or Netflix, the problem where, you, where there is identity in the center and you are connected by the network to your neighbors. In that case, the structure of the graph is really important. And then you need to come up with a different way of, uh, of uh, feeding your information into a network. And I will just mention that today at the end of the lecture. So this is why I, I wrote that Ron Kimmel is responsible to learning geometry while Ron Antalmon is responsible for geometry learning. And you will see uh, more of the second part in the uh, coming uh, three lectures. And now let me just um, mention some other techniques uh, which would allow you to treat surfaces in some coherent way so that you will be able to fit them into, into uh, neural networks. So the first thing that comes in mind is the, something which is called sine, sine distance functions or SDFs. Uh, and the idea is to have uh, a contour, uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional surface and define everything inside as the define the contour as the zero level set. So the value along the, the contour would be zero. And as you enter inside, uh, values would be negative. And as you go outside, value was, would be positive. And each and every point uh, would, would measure as its distance from the zero set. So this would be plus, for example, five. And this point would be minus, for example, three, okay? So, and, and if I would plot, for example, the level sets of this distance function, this is how they would look like. So there would be offsets from the original contour outside. And we have already showed uh, that uh, what characterizes this, ki this kind of function is the fact that the gradient of this function is equal to one almost everywhere. Okay, we call uh, this one an Iconal equation. And the reason that it is called an Iconal equation is that if you look at the level sets of the distance function, they would appear to be something like waves and iconal comes from the Greek uh, word uh, wave, if you like. Um, and this is why uh, solving this kind of equation could uh, enable you to solve, to find a sine distance function from a surface. Now, sine distance functions uh, are often used in order to represent two dimensional and three dimensional shapes, because if you think about it intuitively, if you, if you just look just that it is part. If you just look at the contour, then the numerical support of a contour is really, really narrow. You just know that along uh, this very small set of pixels, 
uh, there is useful information. And now if you consider, for example, uh, this as a picture, and even assume that inside the, inside the contour you have uh, black and outside you have, white, uh, you have white, and you feed it into a neural network, then all interesting events would happen just along the boundary of the intersection between black and white, okay? And you would like uh, things to be a little bit, to have a little bit larger uh, numerical support. So if, for example, you think about the NIST database, the NIST database is a huge database of uh, handwritten letters. So you have two, for example, and this is how the two would look like. It would look like something like that. And you would like to fit it into a network so that at the end of the day, you would know how to classify all the twos from the fives from the, th from the three, then uh, if you just feed it as is, um, the, the numerical support, the effort that the neural network would have to go through in order to be able to classify this as two uh, would be enormous because all the transition between black and white is, is happening at a, uh, at, a, at a boundary which is one dimension or less than the whole picture that you have, uh, if you like. So extending these kind of letters into sign distance functions would be a method of choice if you'd like to help your networks. Uh, more than that, if you think about this contour, then um, if, for example, you'd like to modify it, you'd like it to move according to its curvature vector, okay? We, we, we talked about the fact that if you take a contour and you move it in time so that it would move according to its curvature vector, the second derivative, the acceleration according to the uh, Euclidean arc length, then uh, things uh, may happen. I mean, if you move it, for example, according to a constant flow and the topology can change. If you move it according to the curvature flow, then, then other things may happen. You can have numerical inaccuracies. Uh, representing these kind of contours as level sets uh, is beneficial from that point of view. The numerical uh, algorithms would obviously be more stable because you hold the contour on a regular grid. I mean, you sample your distance function on a regular grid. Uh, and more than that, you can show that uh, a lot of new, uh, topological changes can, can happen. I mean, if you think of a curve that is propagating according to its, uh, uh, to its constant velocity, then after a while, if it would propagate inside, there would be a change in topology and level sets could, could handle that. So assume that I have a curve, okay, a planar curve. We call it C, obviously, which is a mapping, for example, from uh, the unit circle from theta, for example, running between zero and two pi to the uh, to the plane. Okay, then uh, we showed that an implicit representation of this curve would be finding f function, any function, any smooth function whose zero set uh, could be uh, uh, is equal to zero. So if you think of embedding this curve as a zero set of a two-dimensional function, okay, so this would be I'm now using my perspective in order to uh, present this as, as some kind of an implicit representation of a two-dimensional function. So my zero set, I mean, slicing my, this would be my phi function and slicing it uh, with this plane, which is equal to zero would give me back the original contour. So we say that C is the zero, zero set of this, uh, of this function. And if we, for example, plot this function as a, as a zero set, as, sorry, as level sets equal height contours, Kavek over b uh, then this is how they would look like, okay? And, and we pick up uh, this specific contour and we say that the zero level set, the uh, curve at which uh, the, um, this is the waterline, if you like, for this island, uh, this is where you have uh, your, this is the contour that you're interested in, okay? Now, why are um, implicit representation and specifically sign distance, distance functions are so important? Because if you think about it, you can think of a two-dimensional image, okay? Uh, that holds with pixels that holds your curve. So each and every value here in this array would hold the value of this psi function. And on, uh, functions sampled on regular domains, we know how to operate. We can apply convolution neural networks, etc., in order to uh, classify, refine, evolve, whatever you like, uh, our, our data. So implicit representations are good uh, if you would go into a neural network. They are also good if you'd like to avoid numerical difficulties and other um, 
uh, substantial di difficulties that may happen if I'm trying, for example, to evolve or analyze this, uh, uh, this shape. Okay, so now let's uh, give some properties of implicit representations of curves. For example, there is a claim that if you look at the normal of the curve, so uh, let this be the normal of the curve, and if you look at the implicit representation of the curve, which would be this one, then we claim that the normal is equal to nothing but the gradient, okay? And if you'd like the normalized normal, then it would be equal to nothing but the gradient normalized. And you can pick up a sign according to whether it would be plus or minus outside or inside, okay? And obviously the tangent would be just taking the coordinates of the gradient and uh, changing them so that the first one would be with negative and the other one would be positive so that when you do the inner product between the gradient and the gradient bar, uh, you'd get zero, okay? They would be orthogonal. So uh, if this was the gradient direction, uh, this would be the tangent direction, okay? Or this would be the tangent direction. Let's prove this property. Let's prove the fact that uh, the gradient is indeed in the normal direction. Uh, the proof is in fact uh, trivial and it is based on the fact that if I walk along the gradient, uh, along a level set, so this would be a level set of this psi function. And if I walk along a level set, I don't change my height. So the derivative according to arc length of my uh, uh, function where I restrict myself to go on, a, on the level set, on the zero set if I choose it uh, specifically, then I can use the chain rule in order to have the gradient inner product with C of S. Okay, this is what is written here. Uh, psi X times XS and Psi Y times YS, uh, which can be written compactly as the inner product between the gradient and the, and the um, tangent, which means that the gradient is indeed orthogonal to the tangent because I know that when I walk along, uh, along a level set, the change in height is equal to zero, okay? So we know that the gradient is orthogonal to the tangent. And therefore, since the gradient is orthogonal to the tangent, we know that the normal is equivalent to the normalized gradient up to a sign, okay? So we have that the gradient uh, um, that the gradient is giving me the normal. Now, what happens if I would like uh, to get higher order derivatives? For example, the curvature, uh, we said that CSS is equal to the curvature in the normal direction, if you remember. What happens if I'm interested in the curvature? How could I extract the curvature? The curvature could be extracted by taking the second, indeed the second order derivative according to arc length. I mean, if I would just take D over DS here, uh, I could extract the curvature, so let's do that. So there is a claim. The claim is that the curvature is equal to the divergence of the gradient. Now, just to remind you what the divergence is, the divergence is taking d over dx, uh, d over dy, and it's operating on a vector. So there would be v1 here and v2 there. And if this vector is nothing but the normalized gradient, so I can change it to be, uh, V1 would be uh, phi x uh, normalized and V2 would be phi y normalized. And if I apply this, this is the inner product between the divergence and this vector, what I would get is a scalar. So K okay, at the end of the day would be a scalar. And this is how this scalar looks like. This is how this scalar would look like at the end of the day. Now, how would we, uh, how would we work it out? What we know is that uh, if we take the second order derivative, again, walking along the same, uh, the same uh, equal height contour and taking any number of derivatives that I like, I would still, uh, I mean, the change would still be zero. I mean, there would be no change in height. So if now I apply D over DS over the inner product between the gradient and DS, okay? Uh, this is how the inner product between the gradient and DS. And now what I would do uh, is I would apply it by parts. First of all, I would apply the derivative according to, to the gradient and then to the tangent. We know that uh, D over DS applied to the tangent is nothing but kappa N, okay? So D over DS of the tangent is equal to kappa N. And uh, this guy, I need to work 
this guy I need to work out explicitly. So from here I have kappa and n, and instead of n, I could plug in the normalized gradient because I know this is already n. So I have uh, the kappa that I can pull out of this part of the equation. And here I have everything here depends on the, on, uh, the derivatives of psi. And here, if I work out uh, this guy, what I get is um, I get two components. One of them would be the derivative of the x and the other one would be the derivative of the y. And it would be inner product. I mean, if I apply the chain rule, it would be inner product by CS. But CS is something that I can plug in. I mean, I already know that the tangent, the T, which is nothing but XS, YS is equal to the gradient bar normalized, okay? So I have a way of uh, uh, subtracting, of um, um, changing X of S by, uh, by minus y, uh, phi y normalized and the same goes for ys, okay? And if I plug it in and I use the fact that everything is equal to zero, I can pull out the curvature and the curvature is nothing but the equation that you see at the end here, okay? So this is uh, one way to write it. This is another way to write it. And you can also think about it intuitively as the, as the divergence of the normal, okay? Because what happens here is that I look at the divergence of the normal, okay? So how much the, the normal is changing. So we can compute, uh, given an implicit representation of a curve, we can compute almost everything. Almost, I'm not almost, uh, all geometric structures that uh, depend on the geometry of the curve uh, without influencing, which is not influenced by the uh, arc length. So if the arc length is, for example, Euclidean, then you can do everything uh, in the implicit representation. Now, let me just comment of an unrelated problem, or at least a seemingly unrelated problem, uh, which is the uh, optical flow problem, sorry, which is the optical flow problem. The optical flow, flow problem uh, goes as follows. Uh, you have an image, and, in the, and you have another image. Okay, and in the image, there is an object. Okay, and the object is, uh, for example, is, uh, come on. and the object is moving. Okay, so at the second image, it moved, it moved a little bit uh, to the right. And what you're trying to do is find the displacement of each and every pixel uh, in the original image. Why is it important? It is important for coding. It is important for compression. It is important to analyze the motion of object in an image, a person is walking, a car is moving, et cetera, et cetera. So what people have been doing traditionally uh, is using the um, uh, a linear approximation. So what you would like to do is ask the question, given the image i uh, at time t, how would it look like um, at time t plus delta t, okay? And the idea is that you need to take the image at t plus delta t and translate each and every point by dt times the velocity, okay? So what you would like to do is back, is move back uh, each and every point here to its origin so that you will be able to know where the origin is. Now, the problem in optical flow is given i and uh, i at time delta t extract v, compute v, okay? This is an analysis problem. Um, so how do we do that? What we'll do is we'll use the chain rule, uh, sorry, we'll use uh, Taylor in order to expand um, I at, uh, at T plus delta T uh, about, uh, about, its, uh, about X. So it would be equal to uh, the gradient of I times the velocity, DT times the velocity plus second order terms. And if we, at the end of the day, arrange the terms, I mean, what happens here is that we have, um, well, these two terms would go away, okay? They would cancel out. If we now also apply uh, the um, Taylor expansion about um, I uh, at time T uh, at, at each, for each point X. And what we have is that the, uh, derivative of the image in time should be equal, now the dt would go away, should be equal up to first order to the projection of the gradient onto the normal, okay? So this is the equation that we get at the end of the day. Now, 
we have uh, the change of the image in time because we can just subtract one image from the other and then get the change of the image in time. We also uh, have the gradient that we compute at each and every point in the image. So apparently we can compute the velocity at each and every point. Uh, would this be true? I mean, can we actually solve this problem at each and every point? This is a differential equation. Um, and, and the question is, can I actually uh, solve for V at each and every point? And the answer would be yes for very specific types of motion, but in general, the answer is no. Why? Because there is something which is called the uh, aperture problem. If I zoom in into the image and I would look at what is going on uh, at an edge separating between an object and the background. Now assume that this object is moving in this direction, okay? So after a short while, uh, it would look like, now I will try to uh, disconnect it from the, sorry, disconnect it from the red. Let's see if it would work. So after a short while, it would, it would be here, okay? It would be here. Assume that it moves along this direction. So from the point of view of uh, the velocity, nothing changed. I mean, it is, it is still the same. And I don't know, uh, the only thing I can actually measure locally or infinitesimally would be the normal velocity of this velocity. So I can project it onto the gradient direction and this, this part of the velocity is the only one that I can measure if I look infinitesimally at what is going on. This is called the aperture problem. I mean, if you, if you think of yourself as, as um, sailing in a ship and what you have is just a small uh, window that uh, looks over that. Uh, so you have this uh, small window and you're looking over the waves. I mean, you're looking at, at the ship, then what you would be able to see is just the up and down velocity uh, of the ship. You will not be able to uh, see how fast the ship is moving if there is no other thing that would, I mean, there is no other feature that would allow you to do that, okay? And this is exactly the aperture problem. So practically, what happens in shape from shading is that you can, in fact, uh, consider the, so you have this object that is moving and you have this velocity that you're trying to extract. And the only thing that you can do is just take the normal velocity. So this would be the normal velocity. And this would be the only component that you would be able to do. So the normal component in the normal direction, uh, which in the image, if you think about the image, the normal is exactly as we did before, is nothing but uh, the gradient of the image. So this is the only thing that you can extract. So if uh, the change of intensity is equal to the gradient projected onto the, onto the vector, uh, onto this V vector, okay? So this would be, uh, this would be your gradient and, and you project the velocity onto this gradient. And what you get is basically the inner product between, uh, between the normal part. So what you get is at the end of the day that, you, is that you're getting the normal component of the, the velocity times the gradient of the image. And this would be your final uh, normal flow extraction, uh, getting the gradient and the change of the image in time. So, in image analysis, the optical flow uh, would be first of all getting the normal flow and from the normal flow, uh, trying to push in, I don't know, uh, some global structure to the game so that you will be able from VN extract the global V, okay? Assume for example, the, that if you're looking at a moving ball, then uh, the whole ball will move, will move at the same speed and thereby you should be able to extract from VN uh, V back. So this was uh, op the optical flow problem. Let's go to a completely different problem or at least seemingly completely different problem. And what I would show you is that at the end of the day, you will get something uh, completely uh, similar or actually the same as that one. So again, here the input is I. So I can get I, the change of I in time and the change of I in space and thereby extract uh, Vn. And now let's assume that somebody is giving us the velocity by which a curve is propagating. So I have my curve and it is moving at each and every point by some velocity in the normal direction because 
uh, we know that everything which is not in the normal direction can be projected onto the normal direction. So somebody is giving me uh, this evolution rule of a curve propagating in the normal direction. And what I would like to do is propagate the corresponding implicit representation of the curve. So I've embedded my curve now in 2D. And now I have my psi function. So this would be my psi, which would be minus inside and plus outside. And I would like to propagate it so that the propagation would look as close as possible, or in fact identical, uh, to what would have happened would I have just propagated the curve itself, the curve C itself. Okay. So let's do the same trick again. Apply the chain rule on my uh, uh, implicit representation. What I get is that I get the gradient. I get the gradient of uh, phi times the change of the curve in time. Okay, so it would be the gradient times, and now I plug in the uh, given velocity times Vn. Now we know what n is. We already proved that n is nothing but the normal gradient. And V is a scalar, so I can pull it outside of the uh, inner product. And what I get at the end of the day is that my change of uh, psi in time should be equal to the velocity uh, times the uh, gradient of the image. Now there is a small issue here. The velocity is something which is usually given just along the curve. So I need to somehow expand it to the rest of the domain. But this is something that can be done uh, quite easily. For example, if I would evolve my uh, contour according to the level set, okay, to the story, to the curvature, then uh, it would be quite trivial to expand the curvature and actually and we already saw that the curvature is nothing but the div of the normalized gradient. So applying this equation to each and every uh, to each and every um, point would basically lead me to this kind of equation. Okay. So evolving an implicit representation by this equation would account to would be equivalent to uh, evolving a curve according to the curvature flow. Okay, and this is a much more powerful way of uh, propagating curves because I can do everything on a regular grid and therefore I can uh, solve all the problems. Now, this was a really popular way of looking at uh, image analysis problems, I would say is in, in the 90s at the beginning of this, of this century. And now this whole idea is being reinvented uh, and, and people are starting to analyze shapes as sine distance functions. And if you'd like to add, and this is a really important note, if you'd like to add priors to your sine distance function analysis of shapes, go back, uh, read the papers that were published about uh, all these uh, level set based method and use them as semi supervised, unsupervised, whatever you like to call them, and you'll boost your, um, uh, your algorithms by a huge amount. Okay. Um, so what is going on with the level set idea? It handles, it, it handles topological changes. The numerical grid uh, never collide because they are fixed. I mean, you just have your grids and they would never ch change. You just hold the numbers at these specific points. Um, and it is indeed the natural way of dealing with gray level images. And it is perfect for CNNs, okay? Why? Because CNNs really like this kind of, uh, this kind of representations. And it would also hold for three-dimensional objects. Okay, so if you think of a surface, well, I mean, and you can think you can think of a surface as, as some sort of something that includes something else, then think about it implicitly, and then you can apply all your CNNs. And if you look, for example, at an interesting paper, and I will comment about it in a, in a while again, which is called Siren. Uh, and there is also something which is called, uh, I think it is called sine distance function net or something like that. In a moment, we'll see the, uh, the exact. Uh, it's, a, it's a sequence of papers by a guy named Gordon from Stanford. And what he does is, use, is using sine distance functions in order to represent implicit functions. And it shows that if you're looking at reconstruction problem, then these would be uh, quite superior compared to, uh, to any other representation. And it doesn't even use uh, um, a numerical um, 
a regular grid to do that, but he's actually training a network to hold the sign distance function for a specific set of objects. In a moment, we'll see how to do that. Um, if you are talking about, at the beginning of the lecture, we talked about the fact that uh, there is an interesting algorithm, which is called PointNet, again, by a different group at Stanford, uh, Leo Gibas and Hao Su, uh, that was taking a point and embedding it into a high dimensional uh, space. In a moment, I will uh, recall, I will refresh your memory about this algorithm. And this algorithm, uh, I would argue, is very similar to what people have been doing in the a century ago. In fact, um, almost 100 ago, 100 years ago, in order to represent shapes. So first of all, let's let's consider the shape uh, as follows. Assume that I have my object, two-dimensional object, in the plane. This would be f of x. It would have have one inside, zero outside. This is how I define my shape. It is an implicit representation of the shape, but it is a very um, dull and non-interesting implicit representation of the shape. By the way, what I'm saying here would also hold for sine distance functions. In fact, it would be even more uh, discriminative as we do that. What we can do is measure the moments of this kind of shape. How do moments look like? Moments would be just integrating over this function, multiplying by the coordinates. So we need to multiply by x to the power of p, and y to the power of q and the p and q would basically uh, indicate the moments I'm talking about. So the zero order order moments would be nothing but the what would it be? I mean, any ideas of what would the zero order moments measure here? The area density. Thank you. The area. So it would be nothing but integrating over the area. And the first order moments would be nothing but? Center of mass. Center of mass, thank you. So who was that? Yuval. Yuval, thank you, Yuval. So the second order moment would be nothing but the, the center of mass. By the way, you can think of the uh, of F as being equal to one only along the boundary with some width and zero ev everywhere else. Okay, it would be yet another way of looking at the center of mass. Obviously, it would be completely different uh, than, than that, the center of mass, but you can think of an, of a, of an object as either using this, this implicit representation or just like that. Now, you can also think about um, other measures and you can normalize them. I mean, you can think of the normalized uh, moments, which would be nothing but uh, X minus the average, the center of mass of the object, uh, times the uh, object itself. And then uh, you can show that the first order moment would be again, sorry, the zeroth order moment would be just the area. Uh, and then uh, you can see that um, if you normalize, then the center of mass is already centralized. So the center of mass would be equal to zero. Okay, and now we can start. And pe what people have been doing is looking at the, the higher order moments in order to represent shapes. And in fact, they were trying I would say in the 80s and 70s and, and even the beginning of the 90s, they were trying to um, analyze shapes by looking at higher order moments after normalization and, and saying and somehow classifying them, fitting them into these uh, classical classifiers that people have been working on uh, these days, at those days. Okay. Now, what is happening here is the following. We take the function f of x and y, and what we do is basically project it onto the family of function, uh, beta q in the non-normalized uh, case and beta, um, and beta bar in the normalized case, uh, where the uh, inner product is nothing but the double integration or triple integration, if we think about volumes of the function uh, with the betas, okay? So this would be my inner, this would be my de definition of an inner product. Now, getting these numbers or these numbers, you could extract back the shape, but since they are not normalized, it would be done in a really non-trivial manner, okay? So it would be in a non-trivial way. And you can think of normalized uh, polynomials. I mean, these are just uh, one set of polynomials. You can think of other uh, kinds of polynomials. But for the moment, let's do a detour and let me talk about something which is completely different, which is point net. Okay, this is the how-so 
uh, and give us uh, Stanford point net. And the idea of a point net goes as follows. You have uh, a surface in 3D. So you have your set of points. So this would be S, this would be a surface S uh, in, in, in 3D. Okay, it would belong to R3. And you have these points and you look at points uh, which are the realization of S, okay? And assume that I have, uh, I've sampled my surface at N points and I call them PI. The idea of point net is to find a function that would take each and every point. So it would be the same function, but every time you fit as input a different point and it would give you an embedding of the point in a two to the power of 10 dimensional space, okay? So I'm taking the coordinates, the X, Y, Z coordinates of this PI, and I'm applying Psi uh, to this PI. And the output would be a point that I called QI in, in, in uh, R to the two to the power of 10, okay? In a really high dimensional space. Now, what uh, the point that people were trying to do is then, um, so, so for each and every, so if I started with uh, say 1,000 or 30,000 points, sorry, at the end of the day, I'm ending up with uh, 30,000 Q points, okay? So this is an embedding into a high dimensional space and I didn't do anything here. Now, in order to take uh, all these points and somehow fold them into a compact latent representation by which I can, uh, I can discriminate between objects. What they did is take the coordinates of each and every, so this would be Q1, for example, and there would be 10, uh, there would be thousand numbers that are representing Q1. And there is also Q2 and Q3, et cetera, et cetera. So there would be, 30,000 points like that. So what they did is they just look at all these coordinates and max pooled, I mean, looked for the maximum value and use it as, a, as, as the number of the first entry. They did the same for the second entry, for the third entry, et cetera, et cetera. So if you think about this cloud of points, they, what they basically did is find the, uh, the maximum uh, point at each and every, at the maximum coordinate at each and every dimension. Now, max pooling is a good friend of averaging. So just for the sake of argument, uh, assume that you're using average here. Okay, so instead of max pooling, assume that you're averaging all the points along this coordinate. And you're averaging all the points along this coordinate, et cetera, et cetera. So what you'd get is a thousand dimensional vector, and this would be the representation of S. Now, if you think of the previous story about moments and the current story uh, that goes about uh, embedding into an arbitrary space and you are learning this embedding, it's not that somebody is giving it to you, then you can see that the story is very, very similar. I mean, uh, besides saying that I'm looking for moments and uh, here saying that I'm learning the lifting, uh, everything is more or less the same. Now, let me give you another uh, interesting fact. And this is the fact that net neural networks are really hard, uh, are really uh, find it difficult to multiply two input numbers. So if, for example, you take- Sorry, Juan, maybe you can clarify. I, I don't follow the, uh, the point of this exercise. Why do we want to embed a three-dimensional surface in a very high dimensional surface? What I'm- What, what do I'm, we get? What, what, I'm now, um, what I'm now saying is that uh, if, for example, you'd like to, um, Implement, implement this kind of this kind of structure. Uh, then what you need to do is uh, take the the surface and do the inner product with beta uh, one one, and then do the inner product with beta one two, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And now assume that you have one thousand betas like that. Okay. At the end of the day, what you'd get is one thousand mu's. Okay, you'll get um, mu zero one, mu zero two, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so you, you took F, you projected it onto these kind of, uh, of uh, functions. And what you got is a vector of mu's from which you can either reconstruct back the surface or consider this as a, 
one dimension, a thousand dimensional vector that is representing the, the implicit representation of the curve. Okay. Now I'm saying that the same story holds here. You get your curve or your surface and you are doing this journey uh, so that at the end of the day, what you would have is just a thousand dimensional vector that is representing this psi. And the thought was of, um, of uh, more, uh, more Joseph Rivlin was that uh, if indeed uh, the story has the same music, I mean, this is the same song, then networks find it really difficult to multiply if I have uh, two numbers A and B, and I would like to multiply them, then the network, the, the number of layers that you will have to hold would be at least log uh, of the largest number that you are multiplying, okay? So Just a minute, but uh, you're saying that these uh, 1000 coordinates, uh, they really characterize the entire surface, but the function here uh, relates to a single point on the surface, to PI. This is a mapping of PI to QI, not of the, not of the entire surface, right? No, 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 no. Each point here has a point there. Each point here has a point there. What I do is, is mapping each and every PI into a QI. So if you think about it, the first coordinates, for example, could be just X, Y, and Z. So the surface is, is actually still here. I can, I can do the, probably I could do the inverse transform and extract back the coordinates of the surface. But, and here comes the but, the assumption is that I would probably also have X square here and, and, X, and X cube and X times Y and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Why? Because the network, the, the psi that is working on the coordinates sees only the coordinates. It sits for each and every QPI. It sees only XI, YI, and ZI. It doesn't see the neighboring points, okay? It has just three numbers and it has to operate on just these three numbers in order to find these, these points, these Q embeddings. So, what it can do is just find some connections between these X's and Y's and Z's. So why shouldn't I help, I help the network? And this is what more did. Uh, I mean, what should... can I ask a question? Sure. So, so the basically the point net network it converges to, into a, a single solution for uh, uh, input input uh, points, and then if I want another input points, I have to converge. Again, right? So well, it doesn't generalize to other uh, uh, set of points, surfaces. Yes. Well, what you do is you so train. Your, yeah, yeah. What what you do is you train your psi to be the same for all kinds of surfaces that you have. Okay. Now bear with me. Assume that what I'm telling you here, that the story I'm telling now, usually you don't know what this psi is doing. But assume that I would have told you that this psi is in fact projecting onto the set of polynomials. Then the story would have a really nice and happy ending. What would happen is that um, this averaging that is going on in order to extract uh, a single vector out of the number of points vectors that I started with would be nothing but integrating over each and every coordinate. So the end of the story is really nice if it would have been the case. Now, nobody is telling me what Psi is doing, but I'm telling you that if I use my prior knowledge of what moments are doing, and if I look at this whole problem as, 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 a, as a problem of, of uh, trying to understand what this uh, embedding is doing, that I'm telling you, look, if this indeed would have been the case, that, then I know how to help the network. And how did she help the network? Did, did I answer your question? Was it you, Val? The last question? It was uh, yeah. 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 Yes. I, yes. Yes. I understand. Uh, but I would guess that uh, that it it. Uh, I mean, it can probably learn. But if you want it to be better, you have to uh, like pre-train it or something like that. Because sure. in well, a way, you would like to choose the the moments that are better to your uh, structure or something like that. So well, in for, for each. Okay. Sorry for for interrupting, but for each set of of surfaces, you would obviously like to train it from scratch. Yes, exactly. So, in a sense, it's similar to uh, to what is silent doing, but it's slightly more general. Well, I mean, we'll silent in a moment if I'll have time. But but let me let me push forward here. 
And let me just say that what Moore has done is basically taking the X and Y coordinates and pushing them and, and, and uh, lifting them into the X, Y, and Z and all, and all the uh, second order, the ingredients of the second order moments. And when she did that, what happened is that she could train a network that was much, oh, okay, so instead of just three numbers, the network now had nine numbers, but the width of the network and the number of parameter of the networks was much smaller than the original one that operated on the X, Y, Z. And surprise, surprise, she got better results when she retrained the, the point net uh, using, using her pre-lifting idea, okay? Now, you could think of what could happen uh, if you lift into, uh, and I, I don't know, some hermit polynomials, which are, which are orthogonal uh, with respect to this inner product or whatever, but let me uh, pose a crazy idea. And the crazy idea goes as follows. Assume that instead of uh, projecting onto the polynomials, I'm telling you, look, you can project now onto the Fourier. So just take it as, a, uh, as, a, as an idea of what can happen if I would now... Uh, now, in networks, usually you, you say that the uh, input is, 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 is... You don't want to mess with the input. I mean, if you get input as, as some uh, points, then the points themselves should enter the neural network. But then neural networks can cannot do anything with, with points. I mean, you need to somehow lift them into some space in order to do something. So now I argue that instead of doing the point map uh, or, the fun or, or, or the functional maps, and this is an open question, what would happen if I would just lift them into the Fourier domain, okay? Into the Fourier uh, space. Why Fourier? Because we know that Fourier is an optimal basis for representing smooth functions, okay? So let's assume that, for example, I would do that for the uh, sine distance, uh, for the sine distance uh, function representation of all the shapes that I have in my database. So now train my, uh, your network by projecting the sine distance function, not according to a finite set of points uh, for which you know the distance from the boundary, which is what uh, this guy is doing implicit neural representation. This is yet another Gordon paper from the last uh, NIPS uh, that got uh, great results. But rather, first of all, project them onto the Fourier and then do the whole analysis. So there is an alternative way of looking at, at objects and projecting them onto the Fourier is not such a bad idea. And what I'm saying is not projecting the, 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 uh, the object onto the Fourier, but rather each and every, if you think about the Fourier, uh, as, as a function which is hovering, for example, along that direction. I'm doing it wrong, okay? So there is a function that is getting high values here and low values there. Well, it would get high values here, high values there, high values there. So this is where the function is getting the high values and the yellow is where, where it is getting the low values. So what you do is each and every point would be projected uh, onto the first uh, Fourier functions that are characterizing this, this uh, cube, okay? And I can assure you that you would get much better results than what these guys are getting. Why? Because we know that there is some optimality criteria at the back of the mind here. So um, just projecting onto the X, Y coordinates is a very naive way uh, of looking at surfaces in, in, in these um, in this, uh, uh, crazy spaces. Okay, so you can pick up your space, and this is yet another legitimate way of looking at these spaces. Okay, now when uh, I have two minutes, so just let me uh, tell you about further differences between before we before I give the uh, lectures to to Ronen, uh, uh, some further differences between graphs, working on graphs and working on surfaces. So there was a really interesting line of work. I think that uh, Michael Bronstein actually started that, um, to look at, at uh, local operators of graphs as a way of uh, trying to find isometry be isometries between graphs. So there is this uh, uh, wildfler uh, Lehman idea, it's called WL idea, of uh, coloring, iterative coloring of uh, points according to the neighborhood connections. And uh, when the iterative coloring relaxes, they say that if you have the same 
uh, the same amount of colors for two graphs, then, then, then they are isometric. In fact, it was proven that you, you cannot really prove isometry this way, but um, uh, isomorphisms of graphs this way, but it would be a weak way of looking at that. I mean, in probability you would, and uh, there have been some variations of that, which is called KWL. Now, I claim that um, you can apply this for graph. This is great. Uh, but when you try to apply this idea to surfaces, I would argue that there would be difficulties. Why? Because if you think of the same surface, you can uh, triangulate it and, and in fact find uh, discretization for the surface in many, many different ways. Okay, so, uh, and if you try to apply this uh, WL idea to geometries, uh, although Michael is doing that for molecules, um, but over there he treats molecules as, as graphs, then you would have some difficulties, okay? So you need to be careful of uh, which kind of tools from uh, learning geometry could really be applied uh, to, to uh, geometry, so of using uh, geometric methods for learning. Um, 